this week was a difficult week. Uh, first was the horrific uh, German wing air crash uh, that left 150 dead, and uh, that was so horrific. But also, do, uh, two days ago, they had a memorial service, and I found out the president of Germany was there. And I'm, uh, I find it difficult to pronounce his name. Is Joachim Gok. I don't know. Is that how? Am I close? I don't know. I, I, I found out that he was a pastor of a Lutheran church earlier. I've never heard of a pastor being the president of a nation. He is one. Wow. But uh, there he is. That's the man. Well done, pastor. We want pastors to be presidents. Amen. <laughs> Hallelujah. Senior pastors to be president. <laughs> Hallelujah. And then it was a difficult week for India. We lost to Australia. <laughs> Poor Anushka. <laughs> she went all the way to watch this guy score one run and come back. I saw... <laughs> we have cricket fans here. I saw a cartoon and... Anushka is telling Kohli, he says, Darling, bahut der mat karna, sham ko dinner hai. Keta, baby, fikar na karo, main yu gaya aur yu aa gaya. <laughs> For those who understand Hindi. Uh, well, he fulfilled his promise. I'll tell you one thing. Today is Palm Sunday, amen? When the cricket team comes back to India, they are not going to be waved. Palm branches are given a big welcome. You know that. Uh, so they have extra protection in, in Jharkhand, in Ranchi for Dhoni's house. But friends, today is Palm Sunday. And I reminded of a uh, of five-year-old Johnny that was feeling unwell. He had a sore throat and they found a babysitter to stay with him in the house. So the parents and his brothers, sisters, everybody went to church. When they came back, they had palm branches in their hands. So little Johnny said, what is this? He said, oh, you know, we were waving palm branches when Jesus uh, came into the church. You know, we were welcoming and singing Hosanna. He says, what? The one Sunday I miss, Jesus shows up? <laughs> 2,000 years ago, he rode into Jerusalem on a donkey in fulfillment of a prophecy by Zechariah. Zechariah 9.9. The scripture says, Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, your king is coming to you. He is just and having salvation lowly and riding on a donkey, a colt, the fall of a donkey. This incident, the triumphal en entry of Jesus to Jerusalem, is mentioned in all the four Gospels. Today, I want to focus on six categories of people that were present in Jerusalem that day and see the significance that Palm Sunday had on each of them. And I, want to I have entitled my message, The Significance of Palm Sunday. Friend, I want to ask you the question. Did anyone really understand the significance of Palm Sunday that day? Well, let's find out. The first thing I want to talk about is the people on Palm Sunday. The first category of people I want to talk about is the Passover visitors. John 12, verse 12 and 13. The next day, the great crowd that had come for the feast heard that Jesus was on his way to Jerusalem. They took palm branches and went out to meet him, shouting, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the king of Israel. Matthew 21, verse 10 and 11. When Jesus entered Jerusalem, the whole city was stirred and asked, Who is this? The crowds answered, This is Jesus, the prophet from Nazareth in Galilee. Today, for my message, I'm going to be referring to all the four narratives uh, mentioned in the Gospels. Now, John mentions that the triumphal entry occurs a week before Passover. In fact, John 12, verse 1, it says, six days before Passover, Jesus was in Bethany. He was visiting his dear friends, Martha, Mary, and Lazarus. There was, it was a festive occasion. There was excitement in the air. Many participation has been made. A great number of foreigners was going to be coming to Jerusalem. Uh, perhaps as much as one like one like ten thousand people were there in Jerusalem at that time. Now, question is, why did they come to Jerusalem? 
because the temple was there. You see, unlike today, where there are churches everywhere, those days the people had to come to Jerusalem and worship God in the temple at Jerusalem. We find that in the book of Acts chapter 8, where the Ethiopian eunuch uh, comes all the way from Ethiopia, all the way to Jerusalem, Israel, and worships God. And on the way back, he meets with Philip the evangelist. He left his country. He traveled from one continent to another because they worshiped in the temple in Jerusalem. People came from all over. Now, did these people that, came from, come, that had come from all over, did they really understand why this man was riding on a donkey? Why these people were shouting Hosanna? Did they actually get the significance of Palm Sunday? I don't think so. I don't think they really had a clue of what was going on. Friend, if you were part of that crowd that day, if you had come to Jerusalem, I believe you would not understand that too. You would wonder, why is this man riding on a donkey? What's going on? What about the palm leaves? Why are they shouting Hosanna? Why are they save us? Well, the second group of people I want to talk about is the local people. The local residents of Jerusalem, people that had come from Bethany and Bethlehem and, and Nazareth and other areas of Galilee. Matthew 21 verse 8. A very large crowd spread their cloaks on the road while others cut branches from the trees and spread them on the road. John 12 verse 17 and 18. Now the crowd that was with him when he called Lazarus from the tomb and raised him from the dead continued to spread the word. Many people, because they had heard that he had given this miraculous sign, went out to meet him. So there were a lot of local people that heard about him, that have seen him over the last three and a half years. They have witnessed the miracles, they have witnessed the raising of the dead, and most recently the one of Lazarus being uh, risen from the dead. They were there. Did they fully understand the significance of Palm Sunday? Did the local people understand? I can tell you they didn't. Because they came looking for a political Messiah. A Messiah that will deliver them from this, this ruthless Roman rulers. They wanted somebody who would overthrow the Romans. They were anticipating a great political revolution. Especially since this Jesus had powers even to raise the dead. Friends, they were mistaken. They thought this Messiah would overthrow the Romans, but he didn't. His purpose was completely different. The third group of people that was there was the Pharisees, the scribes, the religious people. Luke chapter 19, verse 39 and 40. Some of the Pharisees in the crowd said to Jesus, Teacher, rebuke your disciples. I tell you, he replied, if they keep quiet, the stones will cry out. These religious leaders were greatly concerned about what Jesus might do at the feast. You see, a lot of people are now putting their faith in this Messiah. They're, they're now slowly beginning to understand that this is the Savior. It had a, a devastating defeat on the part of these religious leaders. You see, they were trying in some way possible to get a hold of Lazarus and Jesus and kill them. Kill them in whatever way they could. John chapter 12, verse 10 and 11. So the chief priests had made plans to kill Lazarus as well. For an account of him, many of the Jews were going over to Jesus and believing in him. You can imagine the frustration of these religious people. They were... They were funny, they were quite insecure. A lot of the people that followed them, they came to the temple and are now following this man. John 12 verse 19, I love the scripture. So the Pharisees said to one another, see, this is getting us nowhere. Look how the whole world has gone after him. Friends, did these religious leaders fully understand the significance of Palm Sunday? Absolutely not. They felt they were facing defeat, and they were. And now they were belligerent and planning to silence this man forever. They were desperately trying to save their religion at the cost of killing their savior.
Today, some people do that. We try to save the religion and kill the savior. We try to save the religious observances and have no, nothing to do with the savior. This is the Passion Week, right? And we have different names for different days. I know Wednesday is called Ash Wednesday. Is that true? I didn't get it in the Bible though. Somebody created the ash. Thursday is called... Wait, let me just find the reference for you. It's not there. Friday is Good Friday. In, in Kerala, they call it Sad Friday. Yeah. Dukkha Villiarcha. Sad Friday. I like the English version. I like the Good Friday. Something good came out of the pain. Amen? <clears throat> Saturday is called? Saturday is holy. Sunday is called? Easter. You know, how many Christian people are following those observances today? It's not in the Bible. It's not in the Bible. Don't you ever start following Ash Wednesday, Monday, Thursday, Holy Saturday, and forget the Savior who is hanging on the cross. Don't you start following Lent and keep away from all the non veg at the same time, you're just wanting to murder your own brother that comes to church. There is no Lent in the Bible, by the way. I know it's bad news, but I don't believe it. I, I don't believe in the Lent. It's not in the Bible. For those who are, I'm not against you. But friends, let's get to the core of Christianity. The core of Christianity is not a religion or the observances. That was in the Old Testament. The core of Christianity is about a savior who came from heaven to die for your sins and mine. A savior that you and I need to love more than an Ash Wednesday or a Monty Thursday. Just like the religious leaders, we keep our religion and we kill the savior. I want to challenge you. Did the religious leaders understand the significance of Palm Sunday? No, they didn't. Do a lot of Christians today understand the significance of Palm Sunday? Well, I'm going to preach it. You can forward it on your email to your friends. Those who are part of New Life Assembly, you come here. May I encourage you, fall in love with the master. Fall in love with the one who gave his life for you. Jesus did not come to establish Christianity. He came so you and I will find a way to, the, to, to heaven. He said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man will come up by observing Ash Wednesday. Amen? Are you with me? If you agree with me, lift your hands. If you don't agree, tell me later. <laughs> Hallelujah! The fourth category of people, the disciples. Very interesting people. Luke chapter 19, verse 37. When he came near the place where the road goes down the Mount of Olives, the whole crowd of disciples began joyfully to praise God in loud voices for all the miracles they had seen. These disciples were with him three and a half years. They were super excited. They've seen the raising of the dead. They've healed the healing of the blind. The healing of the lame, they've seen the demons cast out, they've seen him walking on water, they've seen him feeding the 5,000, they've seen him forgiving people of their sins, they've seen him send them out and catch a fish and get a coin out of the mouth and pay the taxes, they've seen him, how he ministered, they've seen him walk with the Father every morning, every late in the night, they've seen him passion for the lost, they've seen him walk to Samaria to meet with that one woman. And get her to the father. They'd seen him non-judgmental against the woman caught in adultery. When everybody wanted to stone her. Friend, they were with him in Bethany that previous week. Where Mary broke the alabaster box and poured the perfume on him. They've seen how he raised Lazarus. But friend, did they understand the significance of Palm Sunday? No, they didn't. 
They did. John 12 verse 16. At first, the disciples did not understand all this. Only after Jesus was glorified did they realize that these things had been written about him and that they had done these things to him. Number five, the fifth category of people, the Roman soldiers. In all of the four gospel accounts, nothing is recorded about the Roman soldiers or their viewpoint. But I can tell you, with such a large gathering of people over the national festival, the Passover, and all the foreigners and the local people gathering in Jerusalem, I believe, I firmly believe the Romans were there, the soldiers were there to maintain law and order. You see, in the past, the, some Jewish people took advantage of the opportunity of this large crowd and they wanted to incite riot among the people. They wanted to, they want to get a faction of people to say, hey, we want to get Get rid of these Romans and we want to have a king. And now that Jesus is on the scene, they have all the more steam in them to ask for a political revolution, to ask for a new political leader. Get rid of this Roman people. No wonder you see them shouting Hosanna. Hosanna means save now, O king. Save from what? Save from these Romans. Basically, they were shouting, get us out of these people. Get rid of these people. We are tired of these people. Save us, O oh God. Save us, O oh King. I can imagine the Roman soldiers on those horses. They were there. And suddenly, they saw a man on a donkey and few people shouting, Hosanna, save us from these wretched Romans. They didn't say that. I mean, they meant it. And they were standing. They, they were initially alarmed. They started looking at this week. And then they saw a man coming on a donkey. And they said, Chalta hai. <laughs> Nothing to worry. This man is not coming on a war horse. He was not coming as a threat. He was coming in humility. He was coming on a donkey. We don't see a sword. We see palm branch. Chalta hai. Let them do what they want to do. Friends, did the Roman soldiers actually understand the significance of Palm Sunday? No, they didn't. They didn't. Karnedo, let them go. Let them do what they want. You see, the Romans had troops and they would do everything to maintain law and order. But they let this procession pass them by because they felt it's peaceful. Now, I want you to focus your attention on the, the one person that was a reason for Palm Sunday. The one man that rode into Jerusalem on a donkey, Jesus Christ. He came humble and meek. People threw their cloaks on the road. They cut palm branches. They cut branches of the trees. And they shouted, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. I personally believe that nobody really understood the significance of Palm Sunday except Jesus Christ. Only he knew. And he made all the preparation for Palm Sunday. He planned Palm, Palm Sunday so meticulously. He came to Bethany six days. He sent two of his disciples to go and say, hey, go fetch the colt of the donkey. Our Lord knew everything about the colt. He knew its age. He knew the colt had never been broken to the saddle. He knew it had to be tied to keep it under restraint. He knew his disciples would be challenged. He even told his disciples the answer they should give when they are questioned. He knew the colt would be readily made available to him. Our Lord also knew the owner of the colt. Jesus had planned the Passover. Everything was going according to his schedule. Friend, the first thing we saw was the people on Palm Sunday. The second thing I want you to notice is the, the purpose of Palm Sunday. What did this event mean to Jesus? Why did Jesus go through this whole mission? I can think of a few reasons why he did this. Number one, he was fulfilling his father's will. This was in total obedience to the will of the Father. 
This was his hour. The scripture says the hour has come for the son to be glorified. Father, glorify your name for the hour has come. You see, at the beginning of his ministry in John chapter 2, when the mother came to Jesus and said, hey, they don't have wine. He says, woman, why do you trouble me? The hour is not yet. My time has not yet come. My hour has not come. So many times he says, the time has not come. This is not my appointed time. But when he comes to the last week of his life, he says, the hour has come. This is why I came. This is why I am here. Number two, he was fulfilling biblical prophecy. And I read to you earlier, Zechariah 9, 9. Behold, your king is coming, just and having salvation, lowly and riding on a donkey, a called the foal of a donkey. This act was in fulfillment of Old Testament prophecy. Wow. Number three, this was Jesus' only public demonstration. You see, earlier he was in public meetings, but he was ministering to people. He was not having a big demonstration. He was not, demonst he was not trying to gather attention to himself. There were times others actually wanted to forcefully go and make him king, especially after the feeding of the 5,000 in John chapter 6. The scripture says, John 6 verse 14 and 15. After the people saw the sign Jesus performed, they began to say, surely this is the prophet who is to come into the world. Jesus, knowing that they intended to come and make him king by force, withdrew again to a mountain to pray. A mountain by himself. Friends, many times they tried to make him king by force. He had power that no other human being had. They've never seen anybody like him. But this one time, when he comes to Jerusalem, he's not getting away from people, he's just riding, into, uh, riding on a donkey into Jerusalem, gathering attention, gathering the people's attention to himself. Because they were proclaiming Hosanna to the king, and he was their rightful king. He was the son of David, biologically. He was their legal king. Number four, he did this because this was a safe entrance to Jerusalem. If you know what happened earlier with, with the rising of Lazarus and a lot of people following Jesus, there was a large number of people, especially the religious people, who were looking for some reason to kill this man. If Jesus had come to Jerusalem uh, more unnoticed, incognito, they would have just found him and just stabbed him on the way. They would have found somewhere to just kill him. By him coming publicly on a donkey and with a lot of people shouting Hosanna, the religious people could not lay hands on him at the Passover. There were too many people around him. They wanted to kill him, but they couldn't. So it was a safe way. Number five, he was publicly announcing his kingship. Jesus was telling the people, I am the king, the promised Messiah. Number six, he was announcing the kind of kingdom which he was going to establish. He did not come on a war horse. He did not come with mighty decorations and, and, and as, as a royal king. He came meek and lowly. He came on a donkey. He did not come to establish a political kingdom. He came to establish a spiritual kingdom. He came in peace. He brought in salvation. He was never a threat. Number seven, this was to prepare for his own execution. See, as he came in, a lot of people started shouting. And on one side, the religious people were getting so angry. So, oh my goodness, so many people following him. I wish I could lay my hands and kill him. This also aggravated the people to rise up against him. You see, his public parade provoked the opposition and prepared his own execution as the Lamb of God, slain on Passover day. 
On one side, there was great rejoicing and reception. On the other hand, as he looked into Jerusalem, there was great rejection. Friend, I talked about the people on Palm Sunday. I talked about the purpose on Palm Sunday. But I want to talk to you the one thing that I've never heard a lot of people preach. I want to talk about the pain on Palm Sunday. The pain on Palm Sunday. Luke chapter 19, verse 41 to 44. If you have your Bible, you can turn to Luke 19, 41 to 44, or you can read from the LCD. Let's, let's read that together, shall we? Everyone, everyone, everyone reading Luke 19. As he approached Jerusalem and saw the city, he wept over it and said, if you, even you, had known on this day what would bring you peace, but now it is hidden from your eyes. The days will come upon you when your enemies will build an embankment against you and encircle you and hem you in on every side. They will dash you to the ground, you and the children within your walls. They will not leave one stone on another because you did not recognize the time of God's coming to you. With great anguish, Jesus is saying, you did not understand the significance of this day. The Lord is taking his last trip to Jerusalem. As he rode, the entire city was right before him. And when he looked at the city, on one side, there was great reception and rejoicing and shouting. On the other side, there was great rejection. There was reception and rejection. When he looked at the rejection of the Israelite people, he wept. He wept because of their stubbornness. He wept because they were unwilling. He wept because they were rebellious. He wept because they will not yield to the voice of the Holy Spirit. He did not just softly cry. He wailed. He wept out loud. Like you weep at a funeral service. He had come to the city many times. He loved every stone, every street, every man, every woman, every child. He loved, he even loved Caiaphas and the band of religious thieves and murderers. He weeps over Jerusalem. This city had a lot of memories. He had been right there, right from the time when the city was created. He was there as a witness to every incident that took place in the city. The Old Testament revolves revolved around that city. When you look at Old Testament, many things happened in Jerusalem. Abraham met Melchizedek in Jerusalem. Abraham came with his son to offer him on Mount Moriah, which is just outside of Jerusalem. King David came and sieged that place and the city of Zion was right there in Jerusalem. Several kings had laid siege over the city almost 30 different times. And just outside the city was the valley of Kidron, where Solomon and the successor kings bowed their knee to Baal and Molech and other pagan gods. Now the Lord was among them, and they're rejecting him. His tears led him to a very passionate lamentation. God had been in their midst, and they did not acknowledge him. Jesus wept. Because you did not know the time of your visitation. I want to ask you, friends, a question. When he looks into your life and mine, do you think he would weep? Have you ever sensed God speaking to you anytime? Have you ever sensed the word of God is speaking to you? Have you ever had a prophet share a prophetic word to you? Have you ever had the pastor preach a message and you felt a nudge in your heart? Have you had a man or woman of God or a counselor come to you and share words and you knew the Holy Spirit was speaking to you? But have you gone ahead and rejected that counsel? Have you gone ahead and ignored it, rebelled against the voice of the Holy Spirit in your heart? Friend, 
How many times would God speak to you? I remember a few times I would speak the gospel with few people and they would outrightly reject it. I mean, they love the religion part of Christianity. They don't want to do anything with the Christ of Christianity. You see, it's wonderful to have the Easter eggs and the bunny and the stars and the Santa Claus. But Jesus meant cross. Jesus meant a completely different way of life. You see, the religion part of you, you can live as you like. Doesn't bother. But when it comes to Christ's part, there is a coming in alignment with His Spirit and with His Word. And there is a, a, a wanting them to please Him. Luke chapter 13, verse 34. You hear the cry of the Savior. Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, you who killed the prophets and stoned those who sent to you. How often I have longed to gather you, your children, together as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings and you were not willing. The nation had wasted its opportunities. The leaders did not know the time of God's visitation. They were ignorant of the scriptures. Jesus could look into the future and then he cried out loud because he could look into the future and see in just another 40 years from that day, he could see the persecution that is going to come into that city. He could see what Emperor Nero would do and later Vespasian would do and then his son Titus would do to that city. Our Lord was looking into the future and he could see the thoroughness of Romans as they dug trenches, built towers and built up great catapults to hurl massive stones against the walls of Jerusalem. He could see the, the various factions within Jerusalem fighting against each other when they should be engaging their enemy. He saw Jews that were escaping, being caught by the Romans, and they were crucified on the walls of Jerusalem all around. He could see in just another 40 years from that day, over a million Jews killed. 10 lakhs of Jews killed in Jerusalem. Luke 23, Jesus says again, daughters of Jerusalem, do not weep for me, but weep for yourself and for your children. For indeed the days are coming in which they will say, blessed are the barren, wombs that have never borne and the breasts that have never nursed. You see, he could see what they were going to endure, what they were going to go through. But friends, today we are in 2015. 80, 70 has already come and gone. And also 70 years ago, we had another Emperor Nero, as it were, and he killed another 6 million Jews. Let's look back and see what happened in AD 70. The Jews had proved to be the most rebellious people in the Roman Empire. During the days of the apostles, the Romans told these people, do not build walls, do not fortify the city. But by AD 60, the Jewish people just did what the Romans didn't want them to do. They built the walls, they fortified the city. In AD 66, Emperor Nero sent Gesaeus Florus and his legions to subdue the city of Jerusalem. When the Jewish people saw this army coming, they got a hold of them. They got a hold of them and killed 5,000 Roman soldiers. The Jews killed them. Well, Ro the Romans were furious. Emperor Nero was furious. He sent Flavius Vespasian and his legions to deal with the city. Vespasian came. About the same time Nero died, so Vespasian was made the emperor. And then he sent his son Titus. Titus came in AD 70. And for the next five months, destruction, devastation, great persecution and trouble came upon the Jewish people. The Jews killed themselves. They did not trust each other. They destroyed each other's food supplies and homes. The Jews became their own enemies. And the Romans came, they destroyed the city, they entered the temple, they desecrated the temple, they burned the temple. Nine lakhs of people were killed in Jerusalem. 
One, th- one lakh of people were trying to escape and the Romans caught them outside the city, brought them and crucified them on the eight sides of Jerusalem wall. All over, people were crucified in AD 70 under Emperor Titus. They were so desperate inside the city, no water, no food. They began killing their own children and started eating them. And the more you read about what happened, it is horrible. The once beautiful city of the east was destroyed just as the Lord predicted. No wonder when he looked at Jerusalem, he wept at the, at the utter unbelief and rejection at the face of God. Why did this happen? Because they would not consider God's visitation on their lives. Friends, I, as I conclude, and I'm going to call the worship team, I want to mention this. In your personal lives and in your family and here at the church and every church, there is a time when the Holy Spirit comes and visits His people. And the Bible says in the book of Hebrews, today is the day of salvation. Today, if you hear your voice, harden not your hearts. Today is the day you want to give your hearts to Jesus. This, this afternoon, I want to challenge you. There is the part of us holding on to the religious part, the religiosity and the religion of Christianity. On the other hand, there is a Savior who came coming on a donkey. I want you to keep your eyes on the Savior that came on a donkey. Don't keep your eyes on some preachers that come in aircrafts and all the fancy cars. That is not the gospel you want to follow. Look at the Savior coming on our donkey. We have a choice today. We can be sensitive at the visitation. We can be very, very sensitive at the voice of the Holy Spirit. Even right now, God is speaking to some of us. And say, hey, just leave the religion aside. Leave the ash, leave the monty, leave the eggs, leave the bunny. Let's focus on the one. This Friday, we observe Good Friday. A day when God came from heaven. When God took our place, hung on a cross. When he shed his blood for the forgiveness of our sins. His body was bruised for the healing of every sickness. We need to keep our eyes on Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. Friends, one of these days, Jesus is going to come back. And this time when he comes back, the scene will be radically different. He will come in glory. He will come on a horse. He will come with the armies of heaven accompanying him. It will be a scene of victory and he will defeat every enemy and establish his kingdom forever. Oh, Jerusalem, oh, Jerusalem, how I long to hold you, but you were not willing. But today, this morning, here at New Love Assembly, we want to tell God, God, we are willing. We are willing. We will be sensitive. We will hear your voice. Please come on in, the worship team. Israel did not recognize the time of God's visitation, but friends, today you and I will choose to recognize his visitation, his voice, his nudging in our heart. I want you to close your eyes, please. The significance of Palm Sunday is simply this. Recognize his presence when he comes among you, when he speaks to you. When a messenger comes to you, when the word comes to you, Recognize it and respond. Respond. Hallelujah. What a beautiful opportunity for us to renew our love for Him. Renewing our commitment to Him. Telling Him, Jesus, we love you. We love you, Lord. Hallelujah.